In this section, I'll introduce you to the major indexes from around the world, and I'll talk about how we calculate index values and returns. So what is an index? An index measures the current price behavior of a representative group of stocks in relation to a base value set at an earlier period of time. In other words, it shows how the average price of a bundle of securities grows or declines over time. We have two types of indexes based on how they're calculated, value-weighted and price-weighted indexes. Price-weighted indexes are older and more easy to calculate an average from. Before we talk about calculating index returns and values, let's talk about the most prominent indexes in the world. First, we have the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, the Dow Jones includes 30 large blue chip stocks of U.S. firms. These stocks are their industry leaders. Almost every sector of the U.S. economy is represented. For example, Apple represents the tech sector and Goldman Sachs and American Express represent the financial sector. Stocks are selected based on their prestige and whether they're an industry leader. Now, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has been around since 1896, which makes it arguably one of the oldest indexes in the world. The stocks comprising the index change throughout time. For example, General Electric was listed on the index from its inception until 2018, after its market cap fell to an unacceptable level. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is our best example of a price-weighted average index. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, the other most prominent index in the United States is the S&P 500 index. And the S&P 500 index comprises the stocks of 500 large companies listed on the NYSE or the NASDAQ. Standard & Poor's identifies these firms based on several metrics. Unlike the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the S&P 500 index is value-weighted, which means the weight of each stock in the index is based on its market cap. This means that Amazon represents a larger portion of the S&P 500 than Allstate does. Standard & Poor's also puts out three other prominent indexes. I've just mentioned the S&P 500, but there's also an S&P 400 mid-cap index, which tracks the performance of 400 mid-cap stocks, and there's also an S&P 600 small, caps, small cap index, which tracks 600 small cap stocks in the U.S. If you're wondering what the breakdown is, right now, really, the cutoff for small cap stocks is about $2 billion, and the mid-cap stocks are generally defined as stocks with a market capitalization between $2 billion and about $10 billion. Anything larger than that is considered a large-cap stock and could lead the, the stock to be listed in the S&P 500 index. Now, the S&P total market index comprises all 1,500 of these stocks. The total market index tracks about 97% of the total market cap of publicly traded stocks in the U.S. So it's a perfect representation of stock values in the U.S. There are dozens of other indexes out there. Another index you should know about is the NASDAQ Composite Index. This index is a valuated index comprised of most of the stocks listed on the NASDAQ. In the U.S., the NASDAQ composite is seen as our best metric for tracking the performance of tech stocks. We also have sector-specific indexes, like the Dow Jones Transportation Average and the Dow Jones Utility Average. Each of these indexes tracks the performance of one of the 11 sectors of the U.S. economy, which we'll talk about in a later video. Now, outside the U.S., there are many indexes. These track the stocks of various markets. So, for example, in Japan, we have the Nikkei. So that's an index that tracks 225 stocks listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. The DAX tracks 30 large blue-chip stocks listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange in Germany. The Hong Sung tracks 50 stocks that are listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And finally, we have Bovespa, which is an index that tracks 60 different Brazilian stocks. Now it's time to discuss price-weighted and value-weighted index averages. Price-weighted index averages simply average the share prices of each stock in the index. For example, 
if a price-weighted index had Apple and Google in the index, and Apple was trading for $100 a share and Google was trading at $700 a share, the value of the index is simply the sum of the prices divided by the number of stocks on the index. So here we have Apple with $100 per share, Google with $700 per share, two stocks. We get a price-weighted average here of $400. Now, let's assume the value of the assets in the index have changed over the course of the day. So, if Apple's share price increased to $110 and Google's share price increased to $900, what would the index value and the return on the index be? All right, so just remember your basic return formula here. Your index value is in time period one, or at the end of this period, is just going to be 110 plus 900, which are the two new share prices, divided by 2, so 505, minus the index value at the start of the period, which was 400, as you saw on the last slide. We'll divide that all by the value at the beginning of the period, 400, and we get 505 minus 400 divided by 400, which gives us a return of 26.25%. Not a bad return. Although price-weighted indexes are simple, in the real world, they can get pretty complicated. Some firms decide to split their shares, meaning one share could become two shares, or one share could even become seven shares. A couple of years ago, Apple underwent a, a seven for one share split due to the price of its shares being too high for retail investors to be able to purchase round lots of the shares. As a side note, a round lot is 100 shares, while anything smaller is referred to as an odd lot. Apple's share price was about $650 prior to the split, and after the split, it was about $93. If you owned one share prior to the split, after the split, you now owned seven shares, each worth one-seventh of what they originally were. Now, the reason this is important is because shares being tracked in an index can split, and the index has to account for this. Now, here's how that's done. Let's say in the previous example, Google undergoes a two-for-one share split. The shares that were worth $700 prior to the split are now only worth $350, but you own two of them. To account for this, we need to take our original equation that we used to calculate the index value at time period zero and plug in the new value of Google shares and solve for a new divisor. Here, we find that new divisor, D, will be 1.125 instead of 2, like it was in our original example. Every time we calculate the value of the index going forward, this will be our denominator every single time. So if we, let's say, estimate the value of the index at another time period, well, at that point, our divisor is still going to be 1.125. So this is what happens in the real world. Now let's talk about value-weighted indexes. Value-weighted indexes weight the assets in them by their market capitalization. This means that stocks of large firms like Apple and Amazon are more heavily weighted and their returns have a greater impact on the return of the index as a whole. In addition to this, the starting value of a value-weighted index is 100. The actual value of the value-weighted index is relatively meaningless by itself. All we care about is how the value of the index changes. In other words, we primarily care about the returns on a value-weighted index. While we can look at the S&P 500 index value and see that it's high or low, what we really want to do is compare it to its historical value. The way we calculate the return on a value-weighted index is by calculating the total market cap at the end of the period, subtracting the total market cap at the beginning of the period, and by dividing the total market cap at the beginning of the period. We calculate the total market cap by summing up the market cap of each of the stocks in the index. All right, let's try an example. So in this example, we have two stocks that make up the bad index. Calculate the return on the value-weighted index. So two stocks, A and B, and we have their share price and shares outstanding on each day, day one and day two. So what is the return on this, on this index 
from day one to day two. Now, I've made it a little easier here by just going ahead and calculating the market capitalization for you. All I did was just take, again, uh, as you already are aware, the shares outstanding times the share price, and that gives us a market cap for each of these stocks at each point in time. All right, so let's go through this right now. So our total market cap on day one is just the market cap of stock A plus the market cap of stock B. So 15,000 plus 40,000 gives us 55,000. Next, we need our total market cap on day two. And again, that's just going to be the 1,000 shares of stock A times the share price of 18 plus the 2,000 shares of stock B times the share price of 22. And that'll give us a 62,000. Here's our index return formula. And our index return is just going to be that 62,000 at the end of the period minus the 55,000 at the beginning of the period divided by the 55,000 at the beginning of the period. That'll give us an index return of 12.73%. All right, now let's try another example since I know that index returns often cause students a uh, few problems. So in this example, we have a very similar case. We have two stocks that are tracked by the good index and we want to calculate the return on this valuated index. So here, what we're going to do is the same thing that we did in the previous example. We're just going to take each of these stocks and calculate their market caps for each point in time. So total market cap on day one is just stock A's shares outstanding times its price per share. So that'd be 5,000 plus B's 800 shares outstanding times share price of 12. That'll give us 9,600. And then we do the same for each of these in the next period, 500 times eight and 800 times nine, and that will give us our total market cap on days one and two. Now, again, we're just using our valuated index return formula, and that'll give us our index returns of 11,200 for day two, and 14,600 for day one, just the sum of these market caps, and we're able to find our index return, which is negative 23.29%. All right, let's go ahead and recap. So I've mentioned that the major indexes in the U.S. are the S&P 500, the NASDAQ Composite, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The Dow Jones is an index that tracks 30 different stocks of blue chip companies. The S&P 500 is probably our most complete, well-known index out there. It tracks the stocks of 500 large companies on the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, and the NASDAQ composite primarily tracks tech stocks. Next, we talked about valuated indexes and price-weighted indexes. Valuated indexes place more weight on stocks with higher market caps, so basically think any big tech company like Amazon or Apple or Facebook. Those stocks their returns are going to have a much bigger impact on the S&P 500 index as a whole. Finally, the value of a price-weighted index is based on the share price of the securities in the index, not the market cap. All we care about is the share price that's listed on the exchange. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, and I will see you on the next video.